We are here for another market update. It is September 2020. We're in the midst of a pandemic. We've got an election in the works. And first time home buyers and home buyers and investors just want to know, is now the time to buy? And, you know, I've been selling real estate for 16 years in, in Toronto in the downtown core. Jason, Outline Financial, you guys have been doing mortgages for decades. I don't want to say how old you are because you're pretty young. I'm just saying you've been doing sure. it for quite a while. And Christian, you too, you're a Young whippersnapper, yar. Um, but you've been you've been, <laughs> you've been selling <laughs> Leslieville, Riverside, East York, and the downtown core for you know well over a decade. And what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a market that's heading in two very different directions. We've got the low rise sector, which continues on its tear. Really, in a lot of ways, I feel like it's been propping up the market because the uh, the media picks up on headlines and talks about how you know there still are there still are bidding wars and. Um, properties that are well priced in desirable neighborhoods and buildings and streets are selling very quickly. At the same time, for months on end, we've been discussing the reality that there is, um, you know, these headwinds facing the condo market, and we're starting to see it happen now. I've been telling a number of my clients that if you're, uh, I mean, if you're buying something very unique and very specific, they come up infrequently at best. Uh, so be prepared to get into not necessarily a bidding war, but maybe a bidding war or the fact that they'll sell quickly. Um, but the average condo um, is, you know, we're seeing more supply come to market. We're seeing prices level off and very much in balanced market territory in the downtown core. So maybe we should start by diving into all of these facts and figures. And let's start, I'm just going to share my screen here. Let's start with, uh, what shall we start with? The market update that the Toronto Real Estate Board presents every single month. So um, actually, let's start right here. Where we're gonna focus our efforts today in the downtown core, more or less along the subway line uh, in the city of Toronto. So we're kind of anywhere from Parkdale, Ronsey, over to you know Corktown, the distillery district, up through Yorkville, mid Toronto. But we do have all of these stats and figures for the East End, Riverside, Riverdale, Leslieville, the Beach, East York. We have them for the West End, High Park, New Toronto, the Junction. So if you have any questions or you want these specific stats on your neighborhood, reach out to us and we're happy to, uh, to get them over into your hands so that you can make an educated decision on what you want to do, buy, sell, uh, invest, or rent. Toronto Real Estate Board, every month, come up with these stats. They're great, very, very helpful, but I find it very difficult to make a sweeping statement about the entire GTA. Would you, do you, Jay, Christian, do you, do you guys feel any differently about these general statistics? I'll, I'll jump in um, from a macro level. I mean, I, I'm, I usually look at these statistics. You across the 905, the different territories in the 905, the different territories in the 416. And, you know, now more than ever, you really have to look at what specific market are you transacting in and, and what specific property type, because things are, are all going in different directions right now. Yeah, yeah I would even, agree. Right now, even like if you're talking about just Toronto, I mean, it's so different from the 905 <laughs> and the other areas of the 416. And then if we, if we you know, micro down to neighborhoods, it's, it's so different from one side to the other side. So we have to, we really have to kind of, you know, dig, dig in deep to know the stats for your specific neighborhood uh, or even condo building for that. For that city. Yeah. And you're seeing that Christian, I mean, in the, in the East end of the city, even condos, I mean, I was in a bidding war on a, on a condo in the, in the East end uh, last week. I'm sure, you know, I'll be in others in the East end too, but that differs very much from some properties at you know, King West or Queen West or, or even in Yorkville. So, uh, this here is what everybody has access to. The Toronto Real Estate Board comes out with these market watches every single month. And again, they're great, but they provide, like Jay said, very much a macro level overview of what's happening anywhere from, you know, Brampton, Scarborough, you know, downtown Toronto. Um, so take them with a grain of salt, but again, very helpful showing there's no surprises here. Unemployment remains high. Um, the sectors that have been hit hardest, we're looking at, uh, you know, friends of mine in hospitality tourism, the airlines, uh, most of my clients that have lost their jobs, which were only a, a handful at the most, have all regained employment. So that's great news. Jay, Christian, are you seeing anything different on the job front side of things? Yeah, I'm the same way, uh, Sergey. I'm the same way. M most of my clients uh, luckily were uh, kept their jobs and only a few, I mean, I mean maybe a handful 
uh, lost them temporarily, but I think uh, they've all kind of come back. Yeah, and, and quickly with us on the mortgage side, uh, where we did see people get hit is if they own their own business. Um, obviously, your revenues are going to be hurting for a little bit. I mean, a lot of those are coming back. And even some professionals, some corporations decided, you know, people would take a pay cut across the board to get to get you through a hump. Um, but we're also starting to see to see that come back. So it's, it's becoming more, I guess, business as usual, if you can say that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is becoming more business as usual. However, I mean, we also have to be aware of what's happening on the coronavirus front. And I'm looking at the news today, we had 300 plus new cases. Um, it's big. Mm -hmm. And I think as the schools reopen, and as the economy has reopened, even though I know that there's a pause for the next four weeks, we can anticipate the possibility of lockdowns and maybe their neighborhood specific. I don't know, like, I have no idea what the government has planned. But I think we'd be naive to assume that there isn't the possibility of us reverting back. I mean, we've seen some semblance of that in BC. So I, I just think it's not all smooth sailing from this point. There's a lot of uncertainty that I, I wonder if some people are, are glossing over. So again, that, that's something that I think people should just be paying attention to. And months ago, speaking on a panel with John Pasalis of uh, Realosophy, I did say that you, people that are buying should really consider having a coronavirus contingency plan, which is what happens if I do, if, if things do revert, right? Am I still able to carry the, the costs of whatever it is I'm buying? So just something to be aware of. Uh, going back to these statistics here, we're looking at, again, no big surprises. Uh, GDP growth is, is down. The other nice thing, I guess, if there was a nice thing about this is interest rates are very, very low. I just got a four-year fixed quote, Jay. Yeah, I mean, I was sub 2%. No, I, I, across the board, uh, high ratio, conventional, any sort of A lending, whether you're using monoline, bank, credit union, everything's under 2% at this point. I mean, this is, I think a lot of that is driving, you know, is driving people to purchase. It's allowing them to look in the future and say, hey, 30 year amortization at less than 2%, I can do that. Um, so, you know, I guess the silver lining is, is that buffer. And we, you know, we're not anticipating rates to go up anytime soon. I mean, you're looking now 2022, 2023, and who knows? Yeah. And again, not a silver lining in, in, in response to people getting sick or dying, course. but I mean, yeah. of course it, it is a nice thing for rates for us to all have the benefit of such low rates. So let's talk about stats. Here are the, the five year, the average month of, of average, sorry, the month of August this year, over August of last year and over the last five and 10 years, we can see comparing detached semi and condo house, house prices, they're up pretty substantially, like anywhere from seven to 14%. These are some pretty big numbers. But if I were to skip forward to the next chart, which looks very, very similar. And just, sorry to interrupt, Brandon, just a reminder, yeah. these are just uh, drilled down to those, those uh, TREB zones that you had outlined before. I know it was a little yes. bit back, but if you're looking at this, it's just yeah, C1, C2, C3, C8, C9, yes. C10. Yeah, and thank you for highlighting that because this is not across the entire GTA. It's just in that downtown core. So again, if you do want statistics somewhere else, please let us know. Um, looking here at the rolling average price growth, uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do here is smooth out seasonal fluctuations. Still very, very, like very good rates of return when we smooth those out over the course of the last year. However, I think we have some headwinds like we discussed before. And if I were to skip very quickly, and again, feel free to jump in, I'm one of you guys, if I'm moving a little too quickly here, but just to hit the highlight reel for people watching, we also have the, uh, the last 10 years of price growth. And again, you can see these seasonal fluctuations depending on the month. And then the smoother line is the, uh, the rolling 12 month average. You can see here what I'm focusing in on when we were kind of at the, I, I guess the bottom, if you want to call it that, when uh, everybody was in some sort of a state of a lockdown earlier in the spring and since then we've rebounded and in most cases the the sale price last month is over the 12 month rolling average with the exception of you know condos were kind of more or less in line with that so anything you two want to want to add to this before i jump to the next slide where we start really digging into sales active listings and whether buyers should be dipping their toes into the market um, I'll jump in for a second. The thing I love about this graph is that even though we have those huge fluctuations, it just still shows how resilient this market has been. Now, I know we talked about it, things could change in the next coming months if you have another lockdown, but 
you know, on, on average, things are still appreciating. I mean, the condo market kind of is kind of flattening out. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, later. But um, um, I just this chart is very important to see how things average out over the long term. No, exactly. And, and it takes a lot to move a 12 month rolling average either up or down. So it's, you know, when you're seeing these past three months, that rolling average moving up, there's definitely there. And we've seen that. I mean, you see that in the media headlines everywhere is, you know, average price keeps going up. It keeps going up. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I would agree. But let's talk about these next few charts, which I think tell a very different story and confirm a lot of what we're saying, which is we're looking at sales and we're looking at sales, let's call it demand, supply, um, you know, listings, we'll, we'll take a look at next. So the month of August this year, over August of last year, all home types sales were up uh, 9% for condos all the way up to 140% for detached homes. So there's been a lot of moves. I'm looking at this and wondering too, that the, you know, the demand for semi-detached, detached, and even townhouses, the growth there, people looking for more space. Even in the condo sector, I have buyers that want to live in condos. They're not looking at a quick flip. And those that are looking at condos are also thinking, you know, this is a, a, a four, five, six, seven year hold uh, for whatever it is I'm buying next, but they are looking at bigger spaces because people are working from home more. Uh, Christian, your clients, are you seeing much the same? They're, the moving is, or the movement is because people want more space, the concern of working from home and, and no vacationing and being home more often? Absolutely. I mean, um, both fronts. I think, you know, I find the, my condo clients that can make the jump to a, to a, to a freehold are, are doing that for those exact reasons. If they have to go another lockdown, they want a backyard, they want green space, they want an extra room for an office. And then, like you said, my, my one bedroom condo uh, clients that maybe can't get into the freehold are looking for that one plus den or two bedroom property mm -hmm. that now has an extra space um, for the home office because we don't know how things are going to kind of play out in the long haul based on how they're going to go back to work. Are they going to go back part time in terms of having to drive into the city or maybe working from home going forward? So I'm seeing that that uh, desire from a lot of buyers just wanting more space. If they can get into the freehold, they're trying to do it. So even if it means moving a bit outside the city uh, to, to get into a freehold, I'm seeing that option as well. Interesting. Um, so here's, like I said, new, new listings, sorry, moving back, sales are up across the board. Now let's talk, I'm actually gonna skip forward over new listings. These are just new properties that are coming to market. So we're seeing over this time last year, huge increases across all home types for the number of new properties coming to market for last month. But what's most important to me uh, is, is what's available at the end of any given month because the active supply shows how many months of inventory, how much supply is there for buyers to choose from. And when we see sales increasing and active supply decreasing, which it has done in the past, that's why you're seeing those bidding wars, prices getting run up, and it can become very frustrating to try and buy. But what we're seeing right now, going back or just reminding everybody that in the condo sector, which is the biggest one, we saw a 9% increase in the number of sales. We saw a 182% increase in the number of active uh, properties available for sale at the end of the month. Even looking at detached homes, which number of sales, 140%, we saw only 48% more listings available at the end of the month. So that's why you're seeing greater demand for detached homes and just less available supply at the end of the month with the exception here of condos. I mean, that is a huge increase. I mean, I was just going to say, I haven't looked at the stat yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if that August 2020 active listing number for condos was probably the highest, if not one of the highest active listings numbers we've probably seen ever within TREB for these territories. Um, yeah. We'll confirm that. And if people are interested, you'll, we'll have that stat <laughs> by the end of this call. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So looking at these, again, going, I know I'm flip-flopping back and forth here between these charts, but even looking at semi-detached and the townhouse option where people may be moving if they want to transition, if they want a small yard or even less, less density, you can see 64% increase in townhouse sales, 170% increase in uh, semis. And then we've got, again, townhouse inventory, a little bit more to choose from. And uh, semis, once again, doesn't 
uh, I'm just going back, still 170 to 113 in terms of um, increases in inventory and sales. So the, the bottom line is there are more detached and semi-detached sales, and there's just less available at, any, at this point in time, even in comparison to this time last year. So let's talk a little bit about months of inventory because this is what the media also talks about. Here is our 12 month rolling inventory averages. And you can see that when the pandemic hit right here back in March and April, when the government told us to lock in, since then we've seen increases across the board with the exception here of uh, detached homes, which did increase and have since come back down. But this is the biggest thing that we've talked about, this increase in condo inventory. This is a pretty substantial uh, this is a pretty substantial change in a very short period of time. Would you Would you all not agree? Absolutely. I mean, you you look back and and to find, you know, something that matches. And knock on wood, but you're looking back at the credit crisis, 2008. The 2012 was, I mean, that was significant rule changes uh, and also supply yeah. um, with, of of new bills that were coming out at that time. So, I mean, we're this is probably. I mean, if you look at that that trend upward, that's probably the. I mean, that, that's steep. <laughs> that, it, it really is. And you're right. You're spot on. I mean, the, the last couple of times that we saw this was the credit crunch, right? And we saw a pretty big increase. And to give everyone some perspective, we're talking three and a half, four months of inventory to get into balanced market territory. So, you know, we, we were there. We hit it for a very short period of time during the credit crunch. We hit it up here for a few years, 2000, what are we, 12 through about 14. Then we kind of just nosedived off the inventory cliff, if you will, and we were hovering around such low amounts that anything that deviated from a seller's market was considered, was probably a huge shock to any seller. So skipping on to the next slide, this is really, really interesting to me. And this is, this reconfirms everything that we've been talking about for the last number of months on these group calls once a month, which is the condo sector, we're in balanced market territory. When I'm looking at these central downtown neighborhoods, so C1, 2, 3, 8, 9, 10, along that subway line in the downtown core, we've got 4.2 months of condo inventory. And 4.2 months is a balanced market. Yeah, and I was just going to say to clarify, so this, this graph, we're just looking at the individual month of August and looking at you know, how many active listings versus sales for that month, whereas the other one, you know, as you're rolling 12 month, it's a smooth average, but you could just see, I mean, 4.2 months of inventory for that August is really pulling up, pulling up that overall rolling average. Yeah. I mean, we're still seeing low levels of inventory in the detached, semi-detached market. And again, very, you do need to be neighborhood specific. Christian made a great point earlier just about what's happening in your building, what's happening in your neighborhood, and what's the demand like? Because it is something that I think people tend to overlook. Uh, even looking at these stats and charts, it's important to understand at any given moment in time what's available, what are you competing against, and how is that going to impact your, your sale price? I mean, yeah, I've just, I, I, you know, this is a good graph. You look at, look at uh, condos when you're going into March. I mean, look at the March to the, you know, you're hovering around, what's that, probably one and a half months of inventory from 2017 to March. And all of a sudden, that, look how fast the month over month spike has happened. Uh, really, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do some highlights here. Yeah. It's not really working <laughs> but you could, out, right? If we just you look at the black, we were, yeah. we were down here, right? Here, yeah. I'm going to delete this. It's like my sports caster <laughs> doing a terrible, <laughs> terrible job of it here. Go but John we went Madden. From, <laughs> yeah, like Jay was saying, we really went from a very, very low level of inventory to, you know, we're in balanced market territory. And I think that in itself is such a huge shock for anybody who's selling a condo because you haven't experienced anything anything else like that in the last, you know, 10, 12, 14, 20 years, mm -hmm. right? So to, to me, this is the, the most interesting chart that we're taking a look at today. Because again, balanced market territory is right around here. Um, and I know I'm, I'm not doing a very good job, but we're in balanced market territory. All other housing types, we've increased, but we haven't increased to, the, to a level that, you know, puts you in the driver's seat as a buyer. If you're a condo buyer, I think that's what's happening right now. Um, so why is this happening? Let's, let's talk about a couple of reasons that we've mentioned before. Immigration. We pulled up this chart. You can see that immigration border closures down without immigrants, without newcomers to our country, without international students. We're going to continue to see, in my opinion, lackluster absorption 
of condos that's going to continue to make it difficult. The other thing I think we fail to recognize is even if we find a vaccine in the near future, I'm talking 60 days, 90 days, it's not going to be able to be disseminated to the public so quickly that all of a sudden overnight over the course of a week or two or three or even a few months from it being um, you know, deemed a success, that all of a sudden everybody's going to go back to some semblance of normalcy. Like that's not what I think is going to happen. And again, this is just my opinion, but that's not what I think is going to happen. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at here that, I've, that we've been commenting on is the completion schedule. So in addition to the fact that we already are in a balanced market territory for condominiums, we have a number of completions of new projects that are scheduled to come uh, online, if you will, over the next six to nine months. So in any given year, we're, at, we're seeing, what, 20, 25,000 new condos come to completion. And right now we have 25-ish thousand scheduled to come to completion. All things remaining the same between now and the end of, what, Q2 of next year? Like, without, those, without immigration, without international students, we, I think we're going to head into buyer's market territory in another 30, 60 days. Well, if you look at that, that's, that's my call. Yeah, if you, if you look at this graph, I mean, we already see that we've already been talking for months how the condo market has been uh, going to kind of the opposite way at the freehold. But look at the, I mean, you know, October and then November just shoots up with a whole bunch of new listings. And then, you know, if immigration isn't back beginning of next year, we have January with a, like a huge 5,000, uh, you know, units injected into the market. So, you know, you mentioned uh, buyer's market. I, I think... I think we're on the way there uh, quite quickly. And again, this is specific, just to clarify, because I know Jake, he's bringing it up, and I want to be clear. I agree. This is in the downtown core. Um, you know, what's happening in Ajax or Pickering or Newmarket, I don't know. I don't pretend to sell there. It's not my area of expertise. I have some great people that work in those neighborhoods that know it very, very well. But in the downtown core, I think you'd be naive to assume that we aren't headed into buyer's market territory unless there is some miraculous... Uh, you know, great news that comes to that that becomes widely available, or a treatment that would allow the government to open up the borders, which I just don't see happening anytime soon, or at least honestly, I hope not. It's not that I don't have friends and family in the U.S. and I love you guys. However, I, I also don't want to open the borders because we're already seeing an increase in cases as a result, likely of of kids going back to school and the easing of opening measures as it is. So th there's a lot to digest here in any given month. And I think, I mean, if, if you guys feel differently, feel free to chime in, but I think we're all in agreement that this is probably where we're headed in the short term. I also want to touch really quickly on, on uh, new developments and the rental market. And they are tied together because most, uh, I mean, 50% of new construction condos generally are going into the, uh, the rental pool. About a year ago, we started noticing that our rentals weren't, renting uh, the landlords that we represent they weren't renting as quickly as they had in the past and uh, we didn't see price changes then of course Airbnb rules changed we had immigration um, kind of put on hold in March as we just touched on and the Airbnb rules you're seeing people transition and saying you know what if I can't Airbnb it's not my primary residence I have to pay all these fees now you know what put it into the long-term rental pool we've seen a flood of furniture rentals come to the rental market there's very few people moving right now they don't feel comfortable moving I mean it's still happening but the bottom line is as you can see in these charts here we're Q2 of this year versus Q2 of last year we had almost a tripling of inventory and where I'm seeing is anywhere from a 10 to 20 percent reduction in rental rates now it could be a little bit less I mean some buildings you might see a five percent decrease but in other buildings you're seeing a 10 15 20 percent decrease over this time last year and the thing that's surprises me the most is, yes, we all want to do um, as well as we can in terms of a return on investment on our, on our properties that we buy, but this is a risk that we all take. And right now, you, my, my advice to landlords is price the property at market value. I don't think it's going to get any better. And if you can secure a tenant today, rather than waiting 60, 90, 120 days, I think you're going to get a better rate. I think you're going to get a great tenant who's willing to pay the market value today. And I think if you're a tenant, and you've got the flexibility to wait another 30, 60 days, I think you'll probably get a better price. I, I'm just going to chime in there. I mean, I, I have some rental properties personally. We have great tenants, and if they're listening, hi. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but Everybody. obviously, you know, you do hear, I mean, you, you would see it firsthand on the, on the real estate agent side. I mean, people are looking at 
they're they're looking what they're paying per square foot uh, in rents, and they're looking, oh well, I could get a den maybe for this little bit extra. So, you know, I'm considering, and and I'll press pause because the tenants, I may have a gift for you at some point. But actually, I'm I'm looking at potentially moving prices down just to keep good tenants in place and keep their eyes from wandering. I mean, it's um, it's it's crazy that it's getting to that point, but it's something to consider. Yeah, I think I think Brandon has the same, but. Um, I'm getting calls from both tenants and from landlords. You know, I think we mentioned, mentioned it in the last, last month's report, but a lot of tenants that I put in last year where they're, it's up this year, all reaching out uh, and one, seeing if they can negotiate a new price with their landlord. And if not, we're looking for something new, either the same space for less money, yeah. or like you said, Jay, they can get the same, they can get a bigger space for the same money. So. Uh, and then the landlord side, they're calling me asking what, what uh, they should do. And like Brandon said, reduce the price down to market value as of today. If it's a good tenant, keep them, give them a re reduction and just don't wait, don't have a risk of having it back in the market for one, two, three empty months. So yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah, it's expensive. I, I'm, I'm surprised. And I just think there's such a, 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 an expectation of rents continuing to go up and up and up. And, and, you know, sometimes they don't. And I, and, you know, for the last few months, we've been touching on, uh, you know, don't believe the hype. I, I'm sometimes surprised at buyers that are buying these new development condos that are assuming that rental rates are going to be $6, $7. I mean, I've seen it happen. And of course, nobody predicted a pandemic. And I'm not going to say that we were clairvoyant and knew that this was in the works at all. I mean, this is uh, hopefully a once in a lifetime event that we're living through right now. And I hope that we get through it and minimize the damage economically and, and across the board. However, you know, these expectations that rent were going to forever go up, it, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. And you have to think, how is this going to impact the sale market in the future? Because there's a very good probability that a number of those investors who thought they were going to get $6, $6.50, $7 a square foot on the rental rates are not, are, are may actually say, forget it. I'm going to get rid of this unit and throw it into the sale market. So I think we've got, you know, another possibly 12 to 18 months before, even if we find a resolution to, the, to this pandemic and we are able to get through it, that it's gonna take a while to burn through the inventory that we accumulate over the next six months until that is hopefully, and again, I'm saying six months, I have no idea, until it's widely available. So th there's a lot for us to consider. Um, while I'm pulling up the stats, I, I, the last thing I want to talk about really, really quickly is, Christian, your area of expertise, which is Leslieville, Riverside, Riverdale, East York, uh, essentially the EO1 district. So while I'm pulling up the charts, why don't you tell me really quickly what you're seeing on the ground, both the low-rise sector, how semis detached, and then condos really quickly. Um, yeah, I, I'm seeing on the freehold side, so I'm, I'm seeing things still selling very well. Uh, everything's pretty much as a bidding war. Um, you know, if there's a bully offer that can be, can be brought forward, we're seeing that. I think you mentioned you had a couple of clients looking uh, in the East End as well, uh, you know, and uh, you maybe lost out kind of because of, of some bully, bully offers. Um, on the condo side now, we, I mean, the density is much less than, than the core and then King West and, and, and probably Queen West and even Yorkville. Uh, we don't just have as, as many condo buildings here, but I will say that I have seen the last couple of weeks things start to slow down a bit on the condo side. Um, just not as many showings as we're used to. Um, I have a listing that's up now, one that would have usually had probably 30, I would say at least 30, 35 showings um, in the first week. We've had probably eight. So I'm saying, I mean, I'm not saying it's the same for every building, but this is a very sought after building. So I am seeing a bit of a slowdown uh, in the condo side, um, but on the pre-old side, I mean, things are still, still moving pretty well. Well, let's talk about this just, just for a minute. We're, we're, I don't want to keep everyone for longer than we already have. So we do need to tweak these charts really quickly. We, we, we want to just preface this conversation by saying that so we, we do have some updated charts here however we want to show everyone what's going on so average home price in the e01 district is up across the board I mean August over August these are huge increases 
for all home types if we smooth everything out and we uh, account for those seasonal fluctuations again in the E01 district, we're still looking at huge gains, even in the condo sector. Like these are huge, right? Yeah. So I think most people would be very, very pleased with that. Uh, average price gains across you know, most housing types in this neighborhood, again, up quite substantially. Christian, you commented on that. You really hit the nail on the head. I'm still getting into bidding wars in the east end of the city for condos. I mean, and I'm not talking about little 500, 600,000 dollar condos. These are condos that are, you know, a million, a million three, a million five that have something very unique and distinct, that low rise, um, that low rise type product that's very unique. And just frankly, not a lot, not a lot will ever come up of that, that type of product. So yeah. it is something I'll, I'll worth noting. But the, the thing that Lesville has going is that most, not most, some of the, the condo buildings have a, more of a, a harder loft feel to it, which is obviously I find the, the most sought after one and uh, probably the ones you're talking about have a more lofty feel. I, and I feel like those ones, they kind of get more, more uh, exposure. And like you said, they probably get yeah. uh, a bit more of a chance of getting into a bidding war. So they're a bit more mm -hmm. unique uh, on the east side just because of the older buildings um, and just kind of the type of buildings they've, they built over the past. Maybe just go back to that one slide before just I mean because this is the same video as before I mean you look at the rolling 12 month average trend and look at look at E1 from 2016 whether you look at the monthly or just that that rolling 12 month average price increase I mean it is it's, it's been on fire <laughs> so you've yeah. got you know you've got some of that momentum I think you know different than maybe some of the other areas even within the core 416 you've got some yeah. solid momentum going into this so maybe there's a bit more padding. Um, yeah. say the worst word happened. I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think I, to Christian's point, it, it's very, it's, it's a different vibe. I mean, I also think the West end of the city has been on fire, had been on fire. I shouldn't use on fire because of what's happening on the West coast. So it's been very hot uh, for years, but the East has really picked up a head of steam to Jay's point over the last number of years. And I want to skip down to this right here, which I know it seems like it's all over the place, but this is the final slide I want to finish off with, which, you know, talking about the east end of the city, you can see that months of inventory for condos, even though that is the type of product that we, we have more of, we're still sitting at less than two months of inventory. So it's still a seller's market generally for uh, properties in the east end of the city. And, you know, detached, semi-detached homes, there's less than a month of inventory, so not a lot to choose from. Right. Yeah. So there's just not much. Um, there's not much to choose from on the pre-old side. No, not at all. So, uh, one final or any one thing that you want to leave buyers, investors, and sellers with before we sign off for this month, Jay. Uh, from from a mortgage side, I would just say if if we do go into um, a second wave or if you know if something uncertain happens, we are going to see deferrals start to slow down. Um, mm -hmm. So the fact you, you maybe you're going to have to start paying your mortgage again. However, some lenders have been open to amending amortization. So say you're paying at a, you know, a 26 year amortization to pay off your mortgage. You may be allowed to extend that to 30 years or even potentially more. Um, so there are options. I mean, if you, if you are running into any of this, uh, you know, give us a call. We could let you know exactly what to ask your lender or we can ask for you. Um, and then the other, you know, interest rates, are insanely low so that could also help if you if you do need the help that's awesome i'm going to sign it off there we are out of time but let's check back in again next month great cheers